Matt DiStefano is a graduate student at the University of Arizona, where he studies the philosophy of the mind. He moved to Tucson after graduating from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, with a master's in philosophy. Today, Mr. DiStefano and I discussed what it means to think before we act, whether humans are smarter than computers, and how he became interested in the intersection of artificial intelligence and philosophy. My name is Matt Stefano. I'm a PhD student here at U of A um, in philosophy. My work is mostly in cognitive science, um, in perception, uh, and I guess an uh, analogously I look at perception and artificial intelligence systems at times. As someone who studies artificial intelligence, uh, do you think that a machine's performance will ever match or exceed that of the human brain? There are a lot of ways in which AI systems seem to already have surpassed humans in processing speed or processing power. There's an interesting question about whether or not artificial intelligence systems could ever be conscious or uh, have a subjective point of view. I'm still torn on what to say about that. Um, yeah. I think there's there's some interesting philosophical philosophical arguments on this uh, this topic. Like John Searle has this famous argument called the Chinese Room. You may have heard of the Turing test. It's the idea that once a computer is advanced enough to have a conversation with a human and convince the human that they're talking to another human and not a computer, then that computer can be considered intelligent. The Chinese room argument is a philosophical argument that questions the validity of the Turing test. The philosopher who came up with it, John Searle, envisioned himself in a room with a list of instructions on how to respond to Chinese characters. When some people outside the room slip a paper under the door containing some Chinese writing, Searle follows the instructions, writing a response to the characters, and then slips it back under the door. The people outside the room are totally convinced that Searle can communicate in and that he understands Chinese, when in reality he's just following a random list of instructions. The idea here is that if a guy can convince some people that he can communicate in Chinese without actually being able to communicate in Chinese, then a computer could do the same thing. Therefore, the Turing test can't actually tell whether a computer is intelligent. What this means for AI researchers and philosophers is that we might need a new metric by which to define a machine as truly intelligent. In terms of future research, what direction do you think your field is headed in? Um, philosophy generally, I think, is interested in, well, I guess there's a few different ways in which philosophy intersects with AI. One is the sort of ethical choices that surround sure. AI, so making AI that is uh, what people in this field call safe, where, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, for instance, uh, one good area that this is pertinent now is self-driving cars, so if a self-driving car has to make a decision between, you know, the safety of its passengers and the safety of a pedestrian, how is it going to make that decision? Um, philosophers, I think, have at least something interesting to contribute there about how to uh, maybe untangle that dilemma. Um, uh, other ways that I think philosophers are naturally interested in AI are um, comparing artificial intelligence systems to something like the brain. Um, what can AI systems tell us about the way the brain is constructed? What can AI systems um, teach us about researching about the brain or um, how best to go about simulating the brain or something sure. like that. Um, so those sorts of areas I think are the main um, avenues. I'm more interested in the latter, but I know a lot of people are interested in the ethical issues oh, around it. So from what I know about AI, um, the predictions made by these models are pretty much based on probabilities. Do you foresee that being a difficulty when trying to model the human brain? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I would question the assumption that human beings don't, don't rely on probabilities. Mm -hmm. um, there's some interesting work in cognitive science lately um, that's called, it's often called like predictive coding, predictive processing views. Um, this is something that's really relevant to uh, perceptual systems, but I think um, might scale up to cognitive processes in the brain. And the thought is that the brain is essentially this a predictive engine um, where it's testing hypotheses about the external world and using input from the sense modalities to sort of, which is the best prediction, which best fits mm -hmm. the world around us. And I think the thought that 
the brain is sort of issuing these predictions, predictions and testing it uh, with input um, might put some pressure against the, the assumption that human beings aren't as reliant on statistical regularities. So what's the focus of your most recent research? Um, it's, it's been on all this predictive processing stuff is, is one of my biggest areas of interest. Um, uh, thinking about what it means for the brain to be issuing predictions, um, how the brain uses different sense modalities that are getting very different kinds of inputs mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, at different time scales because vision and audition take different you know, uh, temporal scales to process that information. And how are those uh, very different sources and time scales of inputs being sort of meshed together to in our experience. Um, and it's interesting to use you know this predictive view to model that uh, because it allows us to understand how these different modalities might contribute to the predictions themselves. Do you think we have free will? I mean one the the study or the the line that comes to mind is these LeBay experiments mm -hmm. where um, you know, he had subjects um, press, I think it was to press a button or something, and they reported when they made their decision and it seemed like the activity was happening after, right. or, or rather, yeah, happening after. Mm -hmm. And it might seem like there's a lack of freedom there. Um, I know there's a, you know, philosophers definitely have picked up on this in the free will debate. I'm skeptical that that should um, completely eradicate the case for free will. Yeah. Um, especially if you think that there's a more nuanced version of free will available in this. And finally, why did you choose your field? Um, originally, I was interested in a whole different set of questions. Um, I came in to philosophy because of philosophy of religion, but um, once I started looking at philosophy of mind, I was like, wait, these questions are really cool. <laughs> um, and I think questions about uh, the nature of our experience and um, how the brain sort of gives rise to the subjective experience were really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's naturally sort of led me to this path of like cognitive science and uh, uh, as a consequence of that, artificial intelligence. So those, that's sort of how I became interested in this question.